different experiences with grad school that I believe are going to prove very helpful to us because to, to hear his experience. He went to Stony Brook in New York. I think he attempted a PhD. He ended up getting a master's degree there. Then he went to Fairmont Colleges in California, at least three of them. And finally, he's back to the area. And I believe he's doing a PhD now in Villanova. Yeah, yeah. So teaching at Villanova and a, a PhD, PhD in Villanova. You don't know, but that, that's right. So, well, thanks for being here. Yeah. Jonathan. Take it away. Yeah, right. thanks for asking me to write that, like, uh, asking, because I I didn't, I said that, like, 30 minutes into the talk last yeah. last year, and <laughs> everyone was like, who are you? <laughs> like, what are you? I just, like, started off and was like, you guys probably are chomping at the bit with questions because you're um, probably, if you're a rising senior, then you're probably anxious about it, and if you're a rising uh, junior, you're less anxious, but you're probably still anxious. Um, and so I, I like immediately started answering people's questions and stuff and didn't even say at all who I was. Um, so yeah, uh, most of these experiences are why I'm here. Um, because, uh, specifically this, this Fulbright thing, the application is your senior year in like, I don't know, September, October, something like that. Um, and that's the application. And um, I'll talk about it later, that it's actually not as crazy to win one as you might think. Um, but when you apply as a senior, you're like, oh, I'm never going to get that. So when December comes around and you apply to uh, grad school and PhDs and stuff, um, you will not have known if you won the Fulbright yet. So I was like, oh, I'm never gonna win the Fulbright. I might as well apply to grad school too. Um, and then in like March, you start hearing about both of them and it turns out I won the Fulbright. So I weighed my options and, and uh, said, uh, well, I'm probably gonna get into a lot more of them if I reapply next year with that on my CV. So I just didn't go to any of them. Um, and so then, uh, during the Fulbright, I reapplied for the, the second time. And so that was, la uh, I gave this, uh, uh, a unscripted version of this talk two years ago, where I just came in, I think it was during COVID, it was 2021, yeah. So, we're, we're, um, and it was just like, hey, ask me some questions. And it, it ended up being the exact same talk because I've been talking to people about this for years because I just now and now with 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 this one, the way that this came about, um, I I fell in love with teaching during grad school at Stony Brook and didn't really like the research part of it. I have come around to the research part of it since then, but um, I loved teaching and I was kind of on the like, uh, I can probably teach community college with a master's degree or or maybe be, I don't know, a lecturer or something like that. Um, and I ended up getting like a visiting professorship at another set, kind of like this, a set of like smaller liberal arts colleges like Bryn Mawr and stuff like that, um, which, yeah, was really weird because they like, you were, they re require a PhD for that type of stuff, but they were, I guess, the like great resignation of people kind of leaving academia, going elsewhere. I was like, oh, cool. I can, I can do that. Um, and then I came, I think it was like winter break like six months ago, and I came back here and met with um, one of the physics professors, Tom Farrell, um, for lunch. And he was like, okay, you need to finish this. Like, you, you enjoyed your year there. It's time to get, if you want to keep doing this, you're going to need to be Even as I found out, like, I got pretty lucky with these small liberal arts college visiting positions because I went to a small place like here, but uh, it's pretty hard to get, like, a uh, community college um, offers. So I was like, okay, I guess I kind of need to get to the community college too. Um, so, and, uh, and then I happened to, um, get a really, uh, pretty cool opportunity. I, and so I'm, I don't really know, you know, how it's going to work yet, but I'm doing a PhD part-time at the uh, so that I can, I can teach full-time and then kind of do the PhD research, um, as I go along. Um, but 
the, you know, even though I've now applied to grad school three times and I definitely have stuff I can say, um, it is definitely still guided by you all. Um, so I will definitely pause, like if there are any crazy questions right now, but I also happened, you notice, uh, as we were, I'm th thankful that we waited just an extra minute because I completely forgot to set up Zoom. Um, I did that a few times with my class and they were livid when I would like start, I would just start lecturing and no one would interrupt me and say, you're not recording. And then the class would go by and they'd be like, we hate you because we didn't write any notes. Like we don't know. So you don't need to be writing any notes right now. You can go back and watch this. I'll, uh, I'll send you this. I'll send you this PDF. You can, you, you know, I made it a PDF so you can click on those links and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, are there any, um, just right off the bat before we even get into uh, the spiel, um, any questions that are like burning um, about if you're a rising senior, uh, something specific and don't feel like uh, as, as the talk goes on, this will naturally happen and you'll get more like, uh, not self-conscious and ask specific questions but people like people like last year it was all just super specific questions they were like i'm looking at this particular program like you know what do you like so it doesn't have to be some generic yeah go for it i'm gonna ask you that question um i've actually been uh i've actually emailed the um person in charge of bring more um, program and um you know currently raising for me to go there for like a day in the life right? cool so, Oh, I've heard that, uh, yeah, so my, um, her sinus was math and physics, the Fulbright was math and physics, but since then it was just physics. So okay. I do know that their math program is below. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right, so physics on math. Right? Yes, yeah, should have specified that. Yeah. Um, it depends on uh, if it's still required. So when I, when I applied, in 2019, uh, which was uh, pre-COVID, and uh, there was already a move away from, I guess when you ask about the GRE, um, are you referring to the regular GRE or like the math, I'll just little m. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know. General, okay, yeah. So let's just give a quick glance here. Um, one of the things I'll be referring to a ton is, is this U.S. news. It's just so, not that rankings actually matter that much. It's just useful to actually, like, arrange things. Uh, so you'd say, like, oh, I, I did, uh, you know, some kind of algebra, number theory stuff, and I like that. And you can, you can say, oh, this is, this is, you know, the best types of things like that. Um, so... One thing we can do, we already mentioned Bryn Mawr, so let's look at Bryn Mawr's math program and just see. Like, I don't, I genuinely, off the top of my head, don't know nowadays if they require the subject test, if they require the regular. So, you guys probably know way more than I do um, with regards to what is required or not. Um, in my experience, uh, most, most places did still require um the subject test um or they um something along the lines of this doesn't look particularly useful it doesn't give me any like application instructions no i think this is generic yeah this is like generic um how to apply online um, yeah, it says specified by the department, but it doesn't exactly tell me that. Maybe I'll do mathematics department, math department, and see if they tell me anything about applications. Um, I think the, the main thing I, I ended up working with was, um, my scores. So the, this one was never an issue. Um, just personally, I, 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 uh, I thought it was, I don't know, compared to, for me, it was the physics jury compared to the subject test. This was fun. Like the subject tests sucked. They were so hard for me, um, uh, which ended up, you know, translating the grad school being, uh, um, like tests and standardized tests like that are just not my thing. Um, so this was like fun. Um, and 
to be frank, I, I don't really think this had much to do with my admissions. Um, this probably did just a little bit, the, the subject test, um, because I applied to places that either required it or recommended it. Like there were a few places that said nowadays they don't even say recommended. They say like um, not considered. So like it's not that it doesn't even give you an option because recommended isn't as nice as it sounds like if you don't do it then that's like something that you're missing. Um, so prospective students, let's see, graduate. No, this is right back to the annoying thing. Um, let's just randomly choose Brown University. I don't need to click on it. Um, Brown Math PhD. If I remember correctly, Brown was one, let's see, completion, maybe this, not required. Neither of them are required. So yeah, that's, I mean, that that is um, one thing that can help you um, uh, a lot in reducing costs as well. I'll talk about that. Honestly, that's probably one of the first things I start almost all conversations about grad school with um, because of my applying multiple times. The first time I applied, um, I got, I, this school is pretty good with financial aid. So I got like a pretty good deal coming here and was like, okay, like I, I saved, you know, a lot of money. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, spend, spend, it's a, it's a career move. I'll spend, I'll, I'll spend money applying to grad school. And I spent, um, an insane amount of money instead of just telling you, um, I will show you my Excel sheet, which outlined this when I did it. I think it was applying to, this was in 2000. Yeah, so this was the second time around. So I'm gonna open both of these. I'll do this one first to prove to you that uh, fee waivers exist. So if you if it says not required for the GRE regular and the subject test, that saves you $27 each time. You, I don't, it may, may have gone up since then, but every school you apply to, if you send, it is one lump sum, like if, if they, for some reason to require both of them. I was under the false assumption that you'd need to pay for both. Um, you don't, you, you just pay the one flat rate and they send all your all the scores that you want. Um, so this was the second time around and here's my application fee column. And literally two of them, so this was after I sent the following letter, which is incredibly easy to get. Um, you do not need to go into the uh, embarrassing amount of detail I went into, uh, which amounted to me like sending a statement, my bank statement, which was like after the Fulbright, I was just like, I have five dollars or something like that. I was like, please don't make me apply to anything. Um, what was this one? This was, um, uh -huh. Yeah, so all this is pretty specific, but all the stuff highlighted in orange is literally all you need to have. Like, you don't need to have this uh, special situation that I had where I'd applied to grad school already. So like, it was even harder because I spent, I'll tell you how much I spent in a second. Um, but this is something that every single person can say because the application fees are like $100 plus potentially each. Uh, so if you apply to a bunch of schools, that's a lot of money that racks up. And if any of them require that, that's also a lot of money. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention, like the the reason I didn't at first, I was just so anxious and was like, uh, oh, they're just going to, it's one thing that's going to lead to me not getting into the program. Like, I don't want to put any extra roadblocks into the process. And rarely... Um, as I got older and cared less, I was, I would reach out to the, like, if I couldn't get a fee waiver from the graduate school, I would reach out to the department. But if you care about not talking to the department, they're usually not the ones giving you fee waivers anyway. It's the graduate school, which for all intents and purposes, uh, will never know who you are. Uh, the, the graduate school is like this big entity that like manages all the little departments. And they're kind of the distinct entities. So if you apply for a fee waiver, it will be the graduate school. And they, you're just a student ID and a, a number. Like they, they have 
rarely ever have any idea who you are. Um, your department will have, it has nothing to do with your admission or anything like that. And so just sending something like this, and I highly doubt it had anything to do with my applying once before. Um, I just said, hey, this will constitute a financial hardship for me. And I also got this, which I sent the same thing to my, like, it, and it doesn't matter how much financial aid you get. If you get any financial aid, then if you reach out to your, whoever runs your, like, financial aid office at your college, you just reach out to them and say, hey, uh, I'm applying to grad school and it's going to be really hard. Can you write me a little? And they wrote me this letter in like an hour. It was like super, they just sent out like this blank template. And the only important thing was just like, yep, paying this will constitute a financial hardship for him. That's it. They were like, we have record that he has financial aid. They didn't say how much or anything like that. Um, you definitely don't need to send your bank statement like I embarrassingly did. Um, and yeah, it was incredibly easy. Um, you know, I, I had a, you know, two, two places, UPenn and Stanford were stingy. And we're like, no, you have to pay again. Uh, but other than that, the only things I paid the second time were when I applied to new programs. So like I hadn't applied to those programs prior, so I needed to send them my GRE school. Um, and just as a, uh, an example of how important this is uh, to, it's like a little extra work that will go a huge way with, with if, if you uh, apply to, like, and I mean, you saw that, I, I will uh, speak to that in a little bit. Those, all those reds are rejections. So, and that's honestly, I think um, what, what I also did the first time was I didn't apply to hard enough places because I was nervous and I wanted to get into multiple things and, and, and have, have options, which is good, um, but you definitely should be like shooting hard. And, and so one thing that getting these fee waivers does is it makes it not a huge, it doesn't like completely defeat you when you're like, not only do you feel bad when you get rejected, but then you're like, oh, great. Like that's a hundred and whatever bucks down the toilet. Um, so just to impress what it looks like if you don't do that, here are some application fees from the first time I did that. Where's the other one? So the only ones that didn't have an application fee were was a, a REU that I did. So I did an REU at a place that happened to have a PhD program and they were like, here's a fee with And I was like, oh, cool. But it didn't really matter because like all the application fees for all these schools are like on average, like a hundred bucks. And I applied to a bunch of them and I sent all my GRE scores. Um, and so in total, that's a really big number and that sucked. <laughs> and then, you know, like I lived abroad and they, the bank statement got even lower. So I highly recommend not doing that. Um, and it's a very small amount of work. And even if they do require, like we just happened to pick Brown and it didn't have the requirement, but if they do, um, if you start now, it really shouldn't be too hard uh, to get the actual like ETS or GRE to enable you to also not pay um, for that. I didn't do that because I didn't have uh, a ton of time. Um, but uh, it, and they are a little bit more strict. Um, where is that? Um, fee waivers. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. Right. Um, yes. And so on any questions about like the fee waiver kind of um, procedure or anything like that? Um, I highly recommend it. I can't, I definitely regret paying for, and everyone told me too. They were like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just apply for the fee waiver. And I didn't, and I definitely regret it. Um, so um, on the topic of money, um, whenever, especially in this, in this, so as a result of us being in math or CS or the sciences, if we want to go to graduate school, it can be free. Um, and you get paid, which is very, like I heard that as a freshman in college and was like, what? Like, really? Uh, and, and completely like shifted what I was thinking of doing uh, based on that. So you do not pay tuition if you're, and this all applies if you are in a PhD program. So that's why I always recommend, there, there are some caveats that I'll talk about, but, um, 
the standard path, at least in the US, which is it, like basically the only country that does this. Every other country, you get a bachelor's and then a master's and then a PhD. But in the US, you can go straight from a bachelor to a PhD and you get your master's in in the part in in while you're there. Um, and it's great uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, at a kind of smaller, at a smaller place, what that means is that you get to start research early. Um, like for instance, Bryn Mawr is a small program. And so when you apply to a small program like that, usually um, you'll be talking with the person who is going to like categorically be your uh, PhD advisor as you're applying, which to me is amazing. Um, and something I should have taken. Uh, basically, my my advisor here uh, when I was uh, at this college got his PhD at Bryn Mawr. And so as I'm doing all these applications, he was like, just apply to Bryn Mawr. It'll be so easy. Like, you'll be super supported. And like, you ha you went to a very small place here. It was lovely. Like, that will be lovely too. And I was like, no, I want to go to a really hard place. And I did, and I hated it. So I was <laughs> like, uh, Go, going the normal like uh, let's like Brown or or Stamp like some like big place uh, Rutgers uh, Stony Brook uh, like big either big state at any kind of um what is the category um, R one university that's like a a research intensive university like a state Penn State is is like a, an example like that any kind of big university or or, or Harvard, any any kind of like uh, big name university, they're big, and they admit you like generally, and so you get in there, and then you it's kind of at least in my experience it was basically a master's and a PhD sandwiched together, so it didn't have the same like uh, you start your research right when you start and kind of do them both at the same time. And so at a place like like the physics PhD students, at least at Bryn Mawr, they may not, you know, uh, do their like uh, candidacy, which is like transitioning from your master's to your PhD. So it's like, okay, you're all done with your classes. You've, uh, you've passed some sort of maybe qualifying exam or comprehensive exam, um, which also, if you're not a great test taker uh, like these two, I would recommend looking for places that don't have those. Um, so these are these are qualifying exams and comprehensive exams are these big exams in graduate school that uh, come like after you've done your graduate course. Um, and I hated them. They were not fun. And they to me, they they acted like a kind of a, a gatekeeping device away from research. Like I, I was at um, Stony Brook is very famous for uh, math and physics. Um, because of their Simon Center of Geometry and Physics. So everyone wants to do like algebraic geometry and string theory and all that kind of stuff. So you're like, I was competing with people who were like postdoc level intelligence and were like 18 years old. Uh, so it was like really uh, tough. And so these like uh, the coursework and the qualifying exams acted as kind of like a, a way for advisors who have like and other people who want to work with them to be like, do that for me, uh, or, or, you know, and, and stuff like that. So that, that was um, definitely not like, for instance, I also, uh, I was weighing, I definitely wanted to stay close to home um, if I was going to do a PhD again. At East, I mean, Stony Brook wasn't super far away, but like, it was pretty isolating and grad school is hard. So I just wanted to get closer to home. So I was looking at uh, Bryn Mawr and Buckley. And I got into both and it was definitely different. So, so, and by that, I mean, the vibe that I got from Rutgers was not what I got from Stony Brook. Um, at least in my, I don't know the math department at Stony Brook, but um, the physics department, at least in like, if you want to do like high energy theory or, or particles and strings and math and stuff, it was like super hard to like actually um, break into that because it, it's not like the same admission process where you are already matched with someone. where at a smaller program, you're like, okay, here's your admission letter. And the advisor reaches out to you and is like, I'm happy you're joining the group. You know, like it, where you already have some kind of pathway. So there's 
on one hand, that is the more, like my experience was more typical in terms of like globally, because globally you get a bachelor and then you get a master and then you defend that. And then maybe you go somewhere else for your degree. Um, and so that, that was like my experience. Uh, and it wasn't bad. Like I still, I still enjoyed grad school. It was just not uh, the kind of uh, uh, amalgam of coursework and research. I thought it was. So it was. It was much more. Mine was like first year and first three semesters was coursework, and then the last semester I wrote a master's thesis. It was like, so yeah, I'm gonna go teach a lot because I like to. Um, so that was that was at least the experience I had and. In, in terms of deciding between these two, PhD and a master, a, a lot of the time people do the master because they, they're here to the commitment. And I, mine's kind of a really good testament to the fact that, uh, especially at a bigger place, um, they expect you to like master out. Uh, not like they're trying to get you to leave or anything like that, but they have so much in place for people who are like, this isn't for me. I'm gonna do, and even at smaller places like Bryn Mawr last year had like two people leave with masters. Like people's lives change, um, and so there's no, you don't get like you know you're not you're not gonna be falling out as a uh, as a PhD student like, just because you don't pay tuition and you get paid to teach. It's like it's not like uh, a, a salary salary. It's like uh, in in general we can look we can look them up because um, they've probably changed since I applied to things. Um, it definitely depends on the region. Um, so here, um, let's see, do we have any kind of information about the program? No. Um, how about math, PhD, stipends? If, what's that? IU. Oh, okay. Let's see here. Uh, what's this? PhD statement survey? Whoa, that's annoying. Um, math. Um, applied math. Here we go. Um, so these look roughly i mean so yeah so these look roughly accurate in the sense they are a little old um but they look accurate in the sense that like this is boston so it's more than well ucla is kind of an anomaly that's uh a pr pretty low um to live in la so that's where like the money is is you, you have to be like oh it's actually um you know going to um university of uh, north carolina chapel hill on 30 grand is actually uh you know I'll be living large there as opposed to um, like Caltech on 30 grand is going to be tough. And it's a lot of these are kind of like 50 grand in Pittsburgh is seems odd. Um, it's, it's a bit, a bit much. The, yeah. So the, these are probably bogus. Um, uh, we had, we had one um, Indiana university apparently has theirs. There we go. Mm. Oh, duh. Yeah. Yeah, it's usually they don't list it flat out. It's usually like in the offer letter, but um Any, anyway, yeah, it's 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 roughly like it's it's um you'll definitely have enough to live on. That's like it's you'll be okay. I was uh mine was uh, uh I think with taxes and everything, I was getting like two grand a month, which like you won't be unless money is not an object and you have or you have something big or or. Or something like that, you won't be getting like an apartment. Um, I, I knew a few people in grad school who had apartments, but they like had a partner who had a real job. Uh, and uh, 
uh, or something like that. Like most most of the things you'll do is as soon as you get into a place, you go on Facebook groups and do uh, blank university graduate student counseling, and then you'll find rooms and houses for like three hundred bucks. Um, which yeah, if you if you get like a if you get a four bedroom apartment or a five bedroom house or something like that, and you share it with other grad students, the the rent is pretty minimal. Um, so you can you can end up uh, doing things like that. And so there were some caveats, like I said, you know, mostly apply to PhDs, um, not masters. Um, one of the reasons um, I say that is because if you go to a place that has a PhD program, the master's degree um, usually will end up not being funded. Um, so you don't get that like tuition remission, which is like you don't pay tuition, um, and you also have to like kind of fight for uh, teaching duties, which is how you get paid, uh, because they have the PhD students that they have guaranteed that in their letters. So I had plenty of friends who were in the massive program at Sony Brook who ended up uh, either getting a scholarship and getting their tuition removed, or uh, just e constantly emailed the department assistant and was like, give me teaching, give me teaching. And they did get paid. Um, so it, it's not impossible. And if you, uh, are a master's student and um, get into a, a program and the advisor is like super um, well-funded or, or something like that. Like I had, I had a student, um, uh, a friend who was on her advisor's grant like as a master's student. So she had that paying her tuition and giving her stipend. Um, so if you find some kind of famous advisor, that's uh, particularly useful. Um, one thing um, about the, the kind of um, the thing I was talking about where in the U.S. you go straight from undergrad to a PhD, that's not the case everywhere else. So what you can do if you were open to um, going abroad for your master's, which I think would be an awesome experience, um, there are a ton of applications and, and scholarships to do so. Uh, the Fulbright, I already mentioned, that was the one I did. Uh, I'll talk more about that later, or if anyone has questions about it right now. Um, but there, are, you can get a master through a Fulbright. I just did like they call it open study research, which is basically um, just doing a research project. Um, I ended up being able, to, like, they let me take classes and everything. Um, so you know, it was it was kind of like uh, I was super ambitious with like what I planned to do. Um, so they were like, uh, okay, uh, make, like they, you know, when I was applying, they were treating me like I was a Dutch PhD student, which I learned quickly is like way more intelligent than an American PhD student. So they were, they were like thinking I was going to be able to like keep up and do cutting edge research in their, in their group. But I was like, uh, I'm not that smart. Uh, and so I did like a review article for a year. Um, and it was, it was awesome. Like I, it has citations, like it's actually legit, but, um, it was it was really fun. So that's one option. You can do this like kind of open study thing. And the reason I did this was because it felt easier to me um, because I could what the the procedure was finding an area of research I liked, uh, finding a country to apply to because you need to apply to a specific country to do this. Um, and the way I did that was like running a numbers game. I looked at all the requirements for all these countries and was like, which one can I not learn a language with uh, or, or speak a language that I kind of already know, um, which eliminated like Germany and Japan and Switzerland or something like that. Like I had a bunch of places that were like really good with universities um, and in my particular field. And then I looked at acceptance rates, which is like an actual data statistic you can find. So if you wanted to do the UK, it would be like a 0.5% acceptance rate. Like it's really hard to do, or like Australia, like things where like people really want to study abroad are hard, but countries like Scandinavia or the Netherlands, where people assume you need a language to go there, the, the fluency is like 97% in all those countries. Like all, everyone speaks fluent English. Um, so there was nothing. And the acceptance rate, I don't know what it is now, um, but when I applied, it was like 18, 18%, which is like a lot more than half of a percentage point. 
So it was, it felt much more uh, doable. Um, and then I, I reached out to a bunch of just cold email people and said, hey, your research is cool. There's this scholarship called the Fulbright, which would essentially mean I'm a free student and I get to work with you. Um, can we do this? And I reached out to like four people and then one said yes. And I was like, that was easy. Um, and then I wrote uh, like a, a little, here's why I want to go here, which is to me felt much easier because there's one person doing this research. He's super famous and he goes to you know this university. So this is why I want to go to this university. I want to study with him. Um, it turns out you can totally just do that for the masters as well. So there are kind of three options for the Fulbright. Um, I was always scared of the master's one because I was like, who doesn't want a master's degree paid for by the US government to go abroad? Like that seems like everyone would want that. So I was like, it's gonna be hard to write a statement of the purpose about because everyone wants that. But I didn't realize that in other countries, unless it's the UK, again, I wouldn't recommend uh, there are other, all those other scholarships I listed have higher acceptance rates if you really want to go to the UK. Um, but the Fulbright in the UK is very hard. Um, and they have like one year masters, which are basically like, <laughs> it's like you overload every semester the whole time. And there's, I don't think, unless you do some kind of special master, most of them like Cambridge Tripos or whatever, it's just like, here's as much class work as you can possibly do. And it's really hard. And, um, but that's the stereotypical math experience in the UK. But mostly, yeah, awesome. Cool, awesome. Um, so, so a lot of them um, in in the Netherlands, that was the experience I had. The masters are two years, and so it's almost exactly the same experience I had. It's like a year or maybe three semesters of coursework and then a thesis. Um, and so if you find a place you want to go, you can just write basically the exact same application I wrote, like, hey, here's this researcher I want to work with. Reach out to them and tell them about this. And if they agree, then now, like, the master's full right looks like there's a reason to do it instead of just saying, I want to go abroad. Um, and, and then there's the, the, last, um, the last category, which is teaching English in another country. Uh, so that's just kind of the short little um spiel there i highly recommend it um, mostly because applying to it um in september or october like in august like so you know prepping it kind of before the school year starts will make uh applying to things like the grad school in december so much easier because applying to grad school i had i think i had one one or two places that were like december 1st deadlines which were awful but even December 15th, which is super common, some are like later, January 15th and stuff like that. But December 15th is still annoying because you may finish finals on December 15th. So like if you leave it until December, it's going to be impossible to, to finish it. So the application process for both the Fulbright and all these other things, um, starting them actually gave, it made applying to grad school a ton easier later on because once you apply to one of these things, um, and, and especially like once you write your first grad school statement of purpose, you don't have to change much. Um, mine were way too long, but the only thing I changed in every single one of them was like the, I had like a section on intended field of study. And so it was a, uh, I had like an overdraw or a overly LaTeX file that had my like, uh, application essay in it and I just commented out uh, the word Stanford and put it Harvard in or whatever and changed uh, the paragraph that talked about who was at that particular university that I thought was cool. So like every, once you do one of them, it's just a copy and paste thing. And so that's why, um, again, why the financial, um, you know, those fee waivers are so important because once you apply to, once you apply to grad school once, applying to, 10, 15, 20 more of them isn't that hard. It's just a matter of finding ones that you think are cool. Um, and there are a million of them. Like this, this US news thing will probably, um, I, there's probably like 180 programs in here. There's a ton. Um, just by virtue of you guys being here, by the way, uh, when you're looking at like safety schools and stuff, 
you should not do what I did and just cl keep clicking next to, to load all the way down to like the lowest thing. I think 100, like, I don't think any of you, just by virtue of you guys being in a program like this, you shouldn't be able, like your safety schools don't need to be below 100. Like you can definitely like set it like 100. I think that's like totally reasonable. Um, and there are, at, oh, I have, that's what, that's right. When you do these subfields like this, they only go down so far. So they stop at like 20, yeah, 20, 25 or something like that. Um, but if you go outwards, or, yeah, so there were 20, yeah, there were 196. Um, some of these uh, don't grant PhDs. Some of them are just masters. Um, and so that's another caveat. Um, if a place just grants a masters, I think last year, one of the ones that we discovered was uh, Wake Forest in, I don't remember where, Georgia. North Carolina, something like that. Um, and that only grants a master's. And because it only grants a master's degree, you're not competing with PhD students for funding. So if they stop at a master's degree, and I'm pretty sure, like if we type in, it wasn't like an unreasonable, um, I don't, is, it, is it just Wake? Or is there some special way? Oh, no, it was there. Wake, I saw it. It wasn't like ranked 150th. It was like, respectably ranked, and I'm pretty sure it only had a master's degree. Hello. Oh no. It's funny the map is in the sciences. Um, I always thought the map was more of an art. Um, okay, that's weird. Um, Wake, Forest, Uni, Math, Ranking. Well, 29th is that. I mean, that's that they're biased. Um, here we go. That's what I wanted. There's no, if it's 20, I would be very shocked if it was 29th and they only stopped at a master's degree. That would be crazy. Um, physics 105. Um, I don't see that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. As as a university, it's ranked in like the national, like not math, like everything. It's ranked 29th in the country, um, which is some uh, somewhat reasonable. But I'm yeah, I'm pretty sure. They only have a master's degree, which means like they, I'm pretty sure they offer tuition waivers and stipend. I'm not, let's just make sure I'm not, things haven't changed since I last talked about this. Yes, preparation for PhD at another institution. Um, requirements, prerequisites, uh, curriculum, teaching assistant, or partial, um, stipend was that. The balance of the tuition. It says partial scholarship are for the balance of the tuition. Oh, okay. So it's 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 definitely not on the level of how accessible a PhD would be in money wise, because you're still paying tuition. So your stipend, which it looks like you know, would be roughly that, regardless if you are a PhD or a regular student. Um but also they have less students. Wake Forest is not a giant university. So it's not, uh, you know, at, at Stony Brook, I was, I was like teaching, like teaching, teaching. Um, so that, that's where they like really like, uh, they get the most bang for their buck because now they have a PhD student teaching something as opposed to a professor that they have to pay way more. Um, where as a place like this, it's, it's like the, they, they may not have the same needs. So, you're getting paid 18 grand, but you have to pay almost 10 grand. So it's like the actual take home is, is, is still pretty low. But anyway, that's, that's like one option where um, if you really were opposed to the idea of committing to something, again, I, I think you really like, I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, like the, the leaving with a master's, um, it was like definitely, uh, I, I you know emailed my graduate program director and was like, hey, uh can we talk i mean he i failed the comprehensive exam like three times at that point he probably saw it coming 
um, and just like, uh, hey, I, I love teaching. And I mean, he, I won like awards every year for teaching in the first two years. And he's like, yeah, okay. Uh, he, you know, asked me like, you know, am I sure? Like, what's my next plan? Made sure I had like a legitimate plan. And he's like, okay, yeah, sure. You can, you know, transition. I found a, 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 the, the kind of way that it's said a lot is like courting an advisor. Like you, when you get into these big programs, you're like, uh, just a, in many faces and you're trying to, you're trying to work with a person and you're like, hey, can I have a small reading project? And you try to, you know, impress them that way. Like, oh, I passed all my courses and you're trying to like get an advisor. Um, and I found that much easier when I was like, hey, I'm just going to write a master's thesis. Can you just like sign off on it? Um, because I wasn't like getting into their research group. I just said like, hey, here's my idea for a master's thesis. I'm going to write it. Can you be my like master's thesis advisor? And they were like, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a, another uh, figure that will give you a sense of scale for Stony Brook. Uh, I don't know about, well, my year was weird because we couldn't accept international students because of the visa issues with COVID. Like I started in 2020, so there was no, uh, yeah. Uh, I can tell you that in total, there were 270. Uh, yeah, so every year was like, and that's the thing, like every year, it wasn't like every year was 50, which is like, that would be, if I saw the number 250, I would like that to be like, and then you, you look at like the total number and then it would be cool if you divided that by five or six and that was how many incoming students there were, because that means after five years, like they're, they're gone. Like the amount coming in is the amount going out, but it was like, it was not that. So it was like, oh, this is, a red flag I did not understand. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. So I, I would definitely, um, it, unless you, um, unless you, especially if you want time to figure out what you want to do, that's another, that's something I, I you know, for me, wasn't something, um, although it should have been. I mean, I'm doing biophysics at Bryn Mawr. Like, it's just that I, I'm still going to be doing a lot of the theoretical physics that I've been doing, but it's very different. Um, so, like, I should have been way more open with, like, what I wanted to do and just been patient. But I was like, this is what I want to do, and I can't do it. Um, so it was, it was a little hard. Um, but if you go into a place and don't exactly know what you want to do, it's not a huge issue if you're if you try out a bunch of things that that would like you can take graduate coursework in algebra and geometry and and then elective courses in your second year and like that's the it, there's no like um even though for me it ended up being important to get into a place where they were like you're in our group if you come you know like it was like like it was a um a group of uh there's only like five professors in there. So like they were like, here's your, um, you know, your options. And I reached out to them and they were like, we'd love to have you. So like, um, for me, that was important. Um, and as I got older, it became more important because yeah, I definitely, I wasn't even going to go back to a PhD. I was like, oh, cool. I can just keep doing stuff like this for a while. Um, so, so that was, that was like a, a, a big thing for me. Um, let's see, are there any other caveats there? Um, these are a few links um, that we found last year where it was like um, fully fun. This is actually a really good website that I completely forgot about until now. Pro Fellow. There's a lot of like fellowships and things like that. Um, let's make sure this link still exists. Yes. So it's a little old. It was from 2020, but they are fully funded master's programs. So ones that tell you that they, you know, there's tuition waiver and you get some sort of stipend. Oh, here's where we found it. Um, substantial financial aid, living allowance. Yeah. Oh, well, um, cool. Oh, there was that thing. I don't know why I went out of order so much. Okay. So this is where, um, the like us news, so, and it's not like 
U.S. News is like a um, the, the rank. Like I said, like the ranking doesn't really matter that much. For in, for reference, like uh, what I stopped worrying about prestige wise is like Bryn Mawr and I don't even think it's on there. Like it's like it's so it's like one fifty. It's like super low, and I don't really care anymore um, because like the advisor that I'm with, she's up and coming and like a super hot shot in this area. And so it, for, it, it doesn't really matter to me, um, like the rankings of stuff. The only reason that I applied, you know, locally, like I said, I wanted to be a little bit closer to home and family and friends, stuff like that. So if you have something like that, that's one way to narrow things down quite substantially. I mean, there's, unless you're in Boston or like this kind of mid-Atlantic area, or California, I guess, there's like not a huge density of universities. So that kind of limits where you apply to stuff if you have a location in mind. For me, when I was applying, I couldn't care less. I mean, I ended up going to the Netherlands. I was applying to literally all across the country when I was looking at things. So the way I did that was doing what you guys are doing. Right now. Um, I did, when I was here, I did summer fellows. I'm sure you guys uh, have seen them all. Um, and I did that, and I worked with my advisor here, who, and I, I loved it. It was uh, the common mantra, I'm sure you've heard it a million times, that all research is good research. Um, and that's totally true, um, because I didn't like it. Like, I, I, I enjoyed, it was amazing. Like, the people I worked with were hilarious and fun. But um, I was like, I wouldn't go into grad school for this. Like, it's definitely not what I would do. And so the next, that was my, after my sophomore year. And then after my junior year, I used the, um, probably, is this an NSF, are you? It's probably, yeah, so you're on the, like, that you guys probably found it in the exact way that I found it, which was on the, like, big search engine. You just search them and you find stuff. And I did that at Lehigh University, which was, it's like an hour, northeast i think or north and uh it was definitely what i wanted to do it was uh, like a mix of math and physics and i thought it was awesome and so i was like oh, like that was that was that was lucky because what i could have done is try something else out and been like okay that's two things i don't want to do it wouldn't have uh precluded me from from applying to grad school it just would have made the process um just a little bit harder it, it would still help that's the thing like if you have two things you know you don't want to do there's, that's just more information that like you can use. So if like you're looking at places to apply, there are, I mean, we just saw there's like 150 of them. Um, so it like, especially when you're looking like at the first, like how do I um, figure out where to apply? You should be like super critical. Um, if you happen to like number theory and they have like, one person in number theory and like 10 people in algebra, like maybe you don't apply to that one. If, unless there's something like drawing you to a place, just don't, just next, there are a million places to apply to if you don't have like a location. For um, so just keep going and, and find people who do cool work, like a, um, a place where there are young people. Here, let's just do, um, I, I mentioned you guys should probably not be applying if you find an awesome program that's below 100 like i said i i think the ranking system is kind of useless um but just because there are so many it is a little bit helpful to use the ranking system at least um because there i mean there is like i it's not that i um don't you know know the value of it i mean if you look at um if you look at a place, let's say you want to stay in academia um, and you look at a place like where you want to teach and you look at their faculty, uh, a lot of them came from Harvard or a lot of them came from Stanford. So like there is some value in going to a very big name place. Um, I just don't really care anymore. Um, so, so there's, they're using the US news. If that is like you um, are shooting for the stars, like then it is a little bit more important. Um, but just using some of these things, let's, uh, so it will actually be easier if I don't do all these like hotshot places um, because all of these places in the top 20 will probably have someone for everyone. Like I'm sure there will be like three people at least at all these places who you think could be cool advisors. Sure. 
Yeah, exactly. Like um, he, he, the lecture notes, right? Um, oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, it happens all the time. There are, yeah. 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 There are like so many hidden gems. Um, and, and that's that's where talking to uh, whoever your advisor is right now, if and that's another lucky part. If you if you what right now, if you love what you're doing, then you can talk to your advisor and they know the hidden gems because they're in the area and they know the people working in this field. Like uh, one example for me was the University of Kentucky, which was, well, obviously Bryn Mawr also, now that I'm in this stage of my life, but uh, the University of Kentucky had someone who was like, had like several thousand plus citation papers because he's just this famous person who had a, like people have lives. They're not just like researchers. So they, they have places they want to be. Um, so there are a ton of those and those are hard to find. Like, um, when you, uh, you'll, you'll stumble on them as you're like looking, you know, if you start at like the hundred and you look at, um, you look at the people, you'll be like, oh, wow. Like you, you, you type their name into a Google scholar or something. And it's like, holy crap, this is a super famous person. It's just like, who happens to be here? Um, and that happens all the time. Um, I was, who, who is the, the, the lecture notes we use for Lee Algebras? Who is that? NC State, okay. The other good. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say. Yeah, let me, um, uh, and then have, can someone call out to me um, if you know what you wanna uh, apply to grad school, like some area, a piatic number or some random thing. We'll just use you as an example. <laughs> Algebraic number theory. Okay, so. <laughs> So we'll, what we'll do is um, let's just pick uh, um, this one. Let's do, let's start at Washington D.C. Okay, so George Washington Uni Math. First step is just find the math department, and usually the people will help. Sometimes the graduate tab will help, but usually it's just people. Um, or research, actually, yeah, forgot about that one. So there's always like a research tab, and it will like uh, collect everything into group, like all those all those groups that we saw over here, where it was like, uh, where's the next one? Yeah, so algebra, number theory, and else like these are kind of um, you know these these weird like, these groupings of math and stuff like that. There's usually a similar grouping over here. So yeah, this is perfect. A good a good. Also, if you if you uh, let's just uh, as you get lower and lower, um, one thing you'll notice about um, some graduate program websites is that they look like they were made in the 70s. Um, I just, I, if it's if you have some other reason to apply to that place, I would. But like, if they don't, like, if they're not advertising to you, and you're on a, if if you don't know where you want to apply, just cut that one. Don't like waste your time searching through an old website that doesn't even work. Just like skip. <laughs> there's there's so much that there's 190 uh, options here um, so this one's good because it, it, it's super helpful easy to navigate and you can say okay um, and, and it gives you exact names so uh, are either of these algebraic what did you say number theory algebraic number theory uh, no not quite is number theory here um, no uh, no. So yeah, this one would not be one to apply to. I don't, I don't see any unless, and Chris, you can call out if I, I don't, sometimes like category theory is a little hard. I don't No, I, yeah, yeah, totally. I, I just, uh, I don't know if like, uh, there's some word I'm missing, some synonym for algebraic number theory. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that, that would be, you know, you just keep going. And if, if I wasn't talking, that would have taken five seconds. You copy paste the thing, put it in Google, look at their faculty page. Do they have someone working in an area I want to? Nope, next. And you just keep going. Um, so let's just, uh, as an instead of going randomly, uh, I bet one of these has one. So let's just do um, NYU, NYU math. Uh, 
Oh, okay. That's interesting. Oh, even, did I just click on the, this is the department website, it's called Dynamic. That's a good sign. I mean, well, not if you want algebraic number theory. Um, algebraic geometry, here's some number theory stuff. So let's, let's open some new tabs for these people. Uh, any other categories here? No, 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 no. Okay, so these are our options. Um, she is a, so one, one thing to notice about these kind of faculty pages, she has tenure, which is good. So not only did she get her PhD super recently, she also has tenure. So at a small place, like for me, this isn't, too big a deal because I am going to such a small place that my advisor doesn't have tenure, but she just finished two postdocs at Harvard. She has like eight grad students already. She's gonna get tenure. I don't really, I'm not that worried. It's such a small place. But at NYU, I would hesitate to advise um, if that said assistant, she is probably fighting for her life to get tenure and will only accept you if you're a team. And so so if if you find a young person. The the draw there is that I bet if we look her up on Google Scholar, she's published like three times a year at least, like probably way more than that, um, because she's young and and that's what young people do. Um, Google Scholar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. As you, yeah. Um, oh, I should have asked. Uh, um, I don't have a math sign at. Um, Oh yeah, I, yeah. So the Google Scholar is sometimes it, it's really it's really helpful if they have them, but you can just use the archive. Um, yeah. So one, 2020, it, but also uh, she is she is tenured, so she probably took a break after she got tenure. Um, 18, 18, 17, 18, 17. 17, like, yeah, so she definitely probably was getting tenure around this time. Um, so that's like uh, super, you know, super productive around this time. Um, so now that things are a little bit calmed down, she probably has more time to advise someone, um, especially at a big, a big place like NYU. Um, and this is something I heard at Stony Brook all the time. Um, you don't need to be a good teacher to get tenure at a place like that. Like if you are a famous person and do good research and get money, like you'll get tenure. Um, whereas- And I'll add something aside, um, that's why I left Washington University because I left it in the time that we told that all the work doesn't matter. Yep. Yeah. And all the time, I was like, I'm already paying for this, especially because we told like, oh, you can get multiple ways again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, that is so, yeah, exactly the case. Oh, yeah. I was told by the grad program director. <laughs> like, it, was, it wasn't a secret. <laughs> they were just like, nope, you don't need to be a good. And I mean, I, uh, at least uh, for me as a grad student at a place like that, it was kind of nice because all the students hated the professors because they were just like these old people that they could not understand, uh, you know, and, and and they were just like really bad teachers. And so they were like, oh my God, you're such a good teacher. And I was like, oh, thank you. Um, so like that was, it was good. For, but but uh, at a place like this, um, there uh, maybe 10% of their tenure review is advising. So if that. So, so if that said assistant, it might be hard uh, to get that person as an advisor. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, so at a place like uh, Bryn Mawr has a PhD program and, you know, a lot of undergrads. So her having, and not eight PhD students, eight students in the group. So she has like five, six undergrads and two grad students. Um, so that is a huge, that's more like 40% of their tenure, having students in the group and doing work with students and stuff like that. So it depends on the thing. Um, so a, this is fine. 
because you know so if that if that highlighted number was 1962 and it said full professor and it was a gray person um <laughs> i would say not that one either so super young and super old is sometimes not helpful um uh, especially if it's if the word emeritus is up there that's not yeah that means they're about to retire or die um so yeah yeah exactly um that means they're like they're they're trying to get rid of them and they're just like just you know do something um it, it's like a transition period but this is like just um and that's what i'm glad nick isn't here because nick just got full right yeah so i i, I said it last year I was like, avoid the full press. Go for associate. Don't don't go for full professor. Um, but but there's nothing wrong with full. Like it, that just means they're good at their job and they got a promotion. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so it's a, it's a super. Uh, exactly. Yep. Um, research gates another good one sometimes the, uh, the reason I say Google Scholar is it has a ton of metrics that are super helpful um, let me uh, yeah yeah stalking people is so easy uh, because you can see like how how slighted they were um, when they did something um, I'm just not going to show myself I'm going to wait until we Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yep. It takes a very long time. Like there, there are uh, uh, Temple University Physics. Uh, just it had a, a, a student who graduated with me here. Um, it was like. All the uh, none of the women passed their comps, and they got comparable scores to some of the men. And it was like like a, a systematic things like that, as as well as some more nefarious gross stuff. Um, and uh, there another student who graduated with me. Her PI is currently like under investigation uh, because of like mal not malpractice. I don't know what doctors do. Uh, I don't being a bad advisor. Um, so like, like just being like a aggressive, uh, like, uh, not like predatory, but like, like just, just like, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. So that's, that's where like, um, you won't necessarily, I, I that's in, if you have a, a research area you like, and you can talk to your, uh, advisor or someone you you're close with, maybe not your, you know, someone ask your advisor, like, Hey, do you know anyone in this area? Uh, can we can we you know talk about this this field or something like that? Um, they they'll know things like that, so that that would be helpful. Yeah, 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 exactly. So like like just because someone had this this person has a Wikipedia article, um, so like in some ways th that uh, would mean. I, I see a little bit of gray. There's a little bit of gray. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like there's like a balance. I I when I was um like the experience I had at Rutgers was very different than than like when I when I got accepted to Stony Brook, it was like I had to like email and email and email until people were I just ended up talking to students because none of the professors like replied to me. And I was like, okay, the students were super helpful. Um, but at Rutgers, it was like, uh, and so this is uh, the reason I'm comparing the two is because they're very similar on paper. They're big state universities, tons of grad students. Um, but I had a very different experience at both. Um, for instance, the person um, I was thinking of working with at um, 
um, Rutgers has a Wikipedia article. And so, um, yeah, he's, what's that? Oh, really? <laughs> Yes, um, you should check the story. Um, and yeah, so this was this was an example where I was I was uh, hesitant because like even if this person you know uh, it's a super famous person they've written textbooks like everyone in the field respects them, um, and so like it didn't really based on my experience at Stony Brook like it wouldn't make sense that they were like come join the group when you get in and I was like oh okay uh, that's kind of cool. So it can definitely happen at bigger places. It just wasn't um, as um, as commonplace uh, for me. And so that's where, like, once you get in, um, you can talk to the students. Um, and that, for me, that was like the biggest um, the biggest thing uh, was talking to the students. I didn't. I think what Chris was saying about the undercurrents and rumors and and the vibe of of a place is something I probably should have looked more into with like older than me like professors instead of students because uh the population was a little bit biased i i was i was reaching out to successful students i wasn't reaching out to like the students who left um so i was reaching out to students who like were the ones i was competing with who were like 19 with master's degree um so like they, and i was reaching out to them as they were you know the only way that i found those students was like through the archive and like, oh, they published with the person I want to work with. So they're already like the people I was talking to were like a year or two out from defending. So they were already super successful. They got in, they did. And so they, it was easy for them. So talking to them, it like made me calm. And I was, you know, led into the kind of like a um, uh, think, thinking it would be easier than it was. Um, so that's how, the, uh, that's the main procedure. Just um, you know, if, if you have location, if you have somewhere, you, uh, a piece of research that you want to do, um, that's how you go step by step and do stuff like that. Um, safety schools, I think um, you can probably just like what I, I wanted to get like 25% of my the schools I apply to to be safety schools. And you can do like, I don't know, 10%. So like if you apply to 10 schools, like the safety school is like the place you are going to get it. Like, so if you have a, um, um, if you go, for instance, some of, I mean, some of you may be at universities that have PhD programs and you're probably gonna get in there because they know who you are. Um, everyone, when I did uh, that um, REU thing at Lehigh, uh, not everyone went, but everyone, um, Everyone who did that RU there um, got an offer to, to that PhD program. So I, I definitely did not need to have, I think I applied to like five safety schools. And like you don't need to get into five safety um, And then you can um, shoot for the stars on the rest of them. Um, yes, already talked about that. Don't have much. Oh, here are some random hidden gems that we've I've found over. I think we found this the first year I did this. They were just uh, um, things like anomalies. Like if you look at the general rankings, the University of Utah is like ranked number thirty nine, but apparently they're really good in algebra, uh, algebra, number theory, and stuff like that. Um, Purdue, same thing. Boston, same thing. Um, if you uh, applied math, these are ones that are are lower down but are super high in applied math. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I would definitely uh, do that. I would say, uh, let's see here. Mm. Oh, this is if you if I don't know I don't even know why this is here. Um, I I mean th there was definitely a thing for me um, when I when was it? Um, I think it was when I was deciding on Stony Brook. Um, like in physics, Stony Brook is super well respected. Um, the other place I got into is also well respected, but just not in my field. It was Johns Hopkins. So, like in general, if you said you got a PhD from Johns Hopkins, that sounds really impressive. But I knew that, like in my math and and theoretical physics, Stony Brook was like more impressive because people like 
everyone who got the PhD from Stony Brook in theoretical physics like got either a postdoc or or uh, whatever. Um, so it, and it was it, this was exactly what I wanted to do as opposed to something else. So uh, like there's differences in like um, like I, I said Lehigh uh, Lehigh is ranked at least in physics like pretty low. Uh, they don't have a ton of professors. They don't have a lot of grad students. Um, but like in general, I'm pretty sure it's pretty high. Like people love Lehigh. They're like, oh, engineers, uh, sports. And so it, it's kind of like Villanova. Like they're like, oh, like it's a name recognition. Like people know it and stuff like that. Whereas like University of Minnesota, if you told people you went there, they'd be like, oh, you know, I'm talking about like general public, people, not math people. If you tell math people you went to the University of Minnesota, they'd be like, nice. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's like a weird, uh, a weird thing like that. Uh, we kind of already talked about this. Like, do they have a good website? Um, if this is a big uh, no-no for you, just find places that don't have that. Um, at, at this point, I'm sure we can just Google it and say, okay, which ones don't have that? Um, uh, are they active? Are they old? Um, yeah, be super critical. Um, this is like an all research, good research type of thing. Yep, it's right there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, again, yeah, I would not, I, I would, as soon as you finish this kind of REU experience, you're going to be in a super good place to apply to stuff. So I would, I would apply to stuff like, I mean, you don't submit your applications in August for grad school, but like you can do all the research for it, like before the semester starts. Um, and the, the other thing I did with regards to being critical, um, I, went overboard the first time I did this, but um, I think at least one person from like something you can do, which will bear fruit later when you're applying is when you look at like who is at a particular university, you can see what their research is. And so you can just send a cold email, like before you even apply, before you decide you're gonna apply to a place, you can just send an email and say, hey, I, uh, I wanna apply here. Um, is there, you know, is there like funding in, in the group? Is is uh, are you guys looking for um, a PhD student to start in the next year or two? Um, you know, what's the procedure like? Do you do like classes first? Like, can we start research um, soon? Like all the kind of questions like like that you um, things that you can't like obviously people want to tell them like hey you have tenure uh, or like you can figure that out um, just based on their title or like um, really active and things like that. Um, and I think getting like a good reply um, doesn't mean like it's going to be, uh, you know, maybe they won't say like, hey, you're welcome to apply. You can join my group if you apply. If you apply. Like, they probably won't say that because they don't know who you, you're a stranger. Um, but if they reply in a welcoming, nice way, that's a good sign. And if they never reply, that's just, in, it's just another way to eliminate places that you apply to. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this was this is kind of like a once you're in type of thing. It, again, this this does depend on what type of university. Um, um, oh, this was like a, a basically this was me like what 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 do I ask the students like uh, what type of stuff? This this is also stuff that you can probably ask um, to the advisor. Um, oh, this is what I'm talking about. Interest in research. It's probably way too much. Um, uh, hey, uh, I'm applying to this. Your paper's cool. Um, here's some jargon that shows that I'm not an idiot. Um, here's my background just a little bit. Uh, are you taking a student in the next year? Um, uh, here's, yeah, here's my CV. And they either replied or didn't reply. Is it in here? No, I just bought my email. Um, and that was like, it was super, all I did was, this is like, I, I just copy and paste. The only thing I did for all these emails is just change that. And that was something I'm gonna put like this, ended up going in my application letter to University of Chicago anyway. So it was, it was just something easy that I could do like, you know, way before like applications were due or something like that. Um, let's see. 
um, grad school visit questions were kind of like, I think these were mostly for the students. Um, yeah, like how long have you been here? How did you figure out your advisor? Um, like what, what do you guys do over the summer? Um, how like how hard is it? Like what is, what is the first year experience like that? And PhD advisor stuff. Um, some of these feel so like, yeah, I don't even know if like going through these is, is super useful because they feel so like, I don't know, uh, formal. And it's it's not super um, important to ask things so formally like that. Um, this one was something that was important for me. Um, I definitely, um, I can, like, I think that was something that surprised me. Like, I can definitely uh, be like a hands-off person. Like, I, I, I definitely, I went to a small school. So I was, when I did research, it was like, I was talking to them all day, like all the time, all day, every day. But like when I did the Fulbright, it was like once a week. So it was like a huge like difference in, in research and it ended up being kind of fine. Like once, you, once you've um, gone through stuff like that, you have at least the skills to, to read old papers and, and things like that and figure out at least what you're up to. Let's see, is there anything more? I think the only thing I wanted to talk about was the NSF. So this is something like the Fulbright that I think if you're applying to grad school, you should do because it's not that much extra work. Um, and if you happen to win it, it is huge. Um, so I, it, with inflation, it probably went up, but it, you, um, all those numbers we were talking about earlier, um, uh, I think this one is 35 grand. Uh, it is your stipend if you get this. So if you get this, uh, your you can still do the the common thing to do is you do your first two years on a teaching stipend, which is like what all your other what all your friends in the grad school will be doing. They're all going to be on the teaching stipend, and so they get their tuition waived, and everyone gets the same before anyone has an advisor. I'm talking about a big thing. If you're already in a small place. Where the advisors already put you on the grant in the first year, that's awesome. But uh, you know, if, if you're or if you're at a big place, then that happens. Congrats! And they probably have more money, and you, you know, uh, they, I mean, yeah, there were some people at Stony Brook um, because they have a big national lab right next door. So if you were in nuclear physics, the stereotype was you only taught for like a semester or a year because you just get money immediately. Um, but the NSF is a way to, if you want to go to a big place. And you don't want to worry about competing with people. If you get an NSF, you don't need to find an advisor with a spot or funding. As long as they, like, if, if you're advising two PhD students already, adding a third, just who, like, is in the group, it, you're, they're probably, you're all going to meet at the same time anyway. So it's not, if you have an NSF, it basically means uh, you're a free student. So they, it's very unlikely that they would, uh, you know, not let you in their research group because you're free. Um, and so not only that, um, if you happen to win that before you get accepted, uh, like if in the like March before like April 15th, whatever, uh, that like graduate school deadline, uh, even if you've been rejected, places, if you win the NSF, which is as a senior, is just a test of if you can write like a research report. It's like, Here's something I want to do. Um, here's what I would do. Here's why. I, here's my like personal statement. Here's my history. Here's like a two-page statement of purpose. It's like the same thing you'd write for grad school, um, but a specific project. And they're as a senior, they're just testing: can you write like a, a proposal like that? And is it feasible? Does it have like? Does it involve the community? Is it like a good science? Thing? Because you don't know where you're going to grad school yet as a senior. Um, and so it's much more, it's easier to win it as a, as a senior applying, uh, you know, before you get to grad school because you don't know where you're going. So I would just like, the way I did it was I said, um, if like, I, 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 yeah, here's just an example. Like my top choice is Boston University. If I were to attend there, um, I've already, you know, I would, I would recommend, you know, reaching out to the person at Boston you like the most and being like, Hey, uh, I'm, I 
am applying to Boston and I have this idea for this thing. Um, can we like talk about like uh, this proposal? And if they agree and say like, yeah, here's, and then you write in your proposal, you know, if I got into Boston, here's what I would do. Um, that looks really good because then you have like this concrete plan. But then you can like not go to Boston. It doesn't matter. Like there's no like legally binding thing. You just have to win the scholarship and then you can go to Stanford. Like there's no uh, uh, kind of like set thing here. Um, because they're just kind of figuring out if you can if you can write a good thing. Once you get to grad school, you can apply for it again or for the first time if you haven't before. But in that case, it's a little bit more strict because they expect you to have an advisor and to have a plan for your thesis and things like that. So it's a little bit harder once you get there. Uh, people do it like someone just won it at Braemar um, because they have an advisor already. They have a publication. They're like, this is what I want to do. And and they apply for it, uh, but it is a little bit easier because it's so open ended. You can say I want to go to Boston, and then you get it, and you get rejected from Boston. But then, uh, well, even if you got rejected from Boston, what I would do if if you won the NSF, you should reach out to everywhere, regardless of whether they rejected you or not. Because if unless it's April fifteenth, you can still get in, even if you're rejected. Because if you not only do you get thirty five grand, but the school gets twelve grand. Just for having a NSF linked program, so they are gonna like you if you if you get if you got the NSF. Um, and yeah, we were looking at a bunch of things last year where it was like something crazy that I I had no idea um, that you can transfer to. So it, the it, the scholarship follows you, not like your plan or your program or something. Also, I just looked it up. The um, fellowship is thirty cents. Yep, inflation. Nice. So, yeah, obviously not nice because like everything's more expensive. But uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah so um, exactly. Um, I think. Oh, this did I make a meme? Oh, I made a meme for transferring because I thought that was just hilarious that you can just like get in somewhere, get the NSF and then leave. Um, yes, and then we're on to Fulbright stuff. So I will send this entire document to Chris. Um, this is still recording, so it'll, I'll send the recording put it on YouTube with the other ones. You can watch those ones. Um, any questions um, about uh, the procedure, anything we talked about today? Uh, also, specific questions, I don't mind. Yeah. Oh. Oh, cool. Okay. Wow. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. I didn't know. That. Yeah, that's a good great point. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great point. Yeah. Oh. I have no idea. Um, let's see. Uh, in here somewhere. I feel like personal statement was more like, actually, it'll probably be easier if I just uh, go on. Um, what is it called? Overleaf now? Overleaf. Um, the statement of grant purpose was the one that I changed like a paragraph every time for every new university. Um, the statement. The personal statement, that's the same for everything. Um, so let me, oh, there's gonna be a million. I've applied to so many things over the years. Uh, if I type the word personal, there's gonna be like so many things. Yeah, um, yeah, here's one. And then we'll do um, the statement of grant purpose. So this was University of Illinois. 
Oh, I need a new computer so bad. This is from 2011, if you can believe it. I know. <laughs> um, I figured out that you can like, what's the main reason people get new like Apple products? The battery. You're like, oh, my phone barely stays charged. My laptop dies. You can just buy a new battery and it's like $20. And so I've been, this baby has been going for some time. Um, U, I, U, C. No, there's just that. Um, how about 2020 um, statement, probably, of grand purpose or something like that? There we go. Statement of purpose. Well, this one worked, so let's do that one. Actually, let's probably not do that one because Stony Brook also has a lot of Dutch people, and I had a famous Dutch advisor in the Netherlands, so I probably got in for that reason. Uh, but it's the same, it's the same format for all of them. So it doesn't really matter actually. Um, let's do PDF, little title page, academic purpose. Um, so, I mean, there is a little bit about like the journey, like, oh, I, this is, I was, I was doing an RU program and I figured out I love this. So now I'm going to go, you know, apply to PhDs and stuff. Um, this was the only thing that changed every time. It was like, uh, you know, this university has really good stuff in this field. Um, so this is why I want to go there. Um, yeah, this one's way too long. Um, what what other like categories are there? That oh good Jesus. Um, this is probably not necessary. Maybe they didn't have like a CV section. I don't know why I would put this in here. Um, yeah, there's, or maybe what I did was like my CV probably has like that, like it has like a line or whatever. And this is like just additional information. Uh, but this is all, this can probably all go in a CV. I don't know why I have all this crap. Um, anyway, so the, this is also labeled incorrectly. If you see up here, it says personal statement, but it's not a personal statement. Um, so yeah, this is the statement of purpose. This is like, um, hey, look, I'm a, I can be a mathematician, and here's why I want to go there. Statement of purpose is like, I have no idea what I wrote about. It's probably going to be embarrassing. Um, go out a little bit. Personal statement. That's the same thing. It's the same like. Oh, well, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, this is a, a statement of grand purpose. Um, how about, um, let's do personal again. Um, well, this one's called personal statement and it's in a folder. Um, let's do that one. Because it's definitely shorter. I feel like the personal statements are like, th those are the ones that are usually limited to like a page or something. Um, this is a statement of purpose too. What is wrong with me? What? Hobbies? <laughs> I'm a loser if you haven't uh, figured that out yet. Um, uh, it's, they're probably all out of date. Um, personal. I need to find a personal statement for you. This is so weird. Um, which one? Oh, two, there we go. I wonder what this is for. <laughs> Just a generic, two, whenever you need a two page personal statement, this is what you put in there. It's, I bet there's no margins or anything. Yeah. Um, oh, statement of goals. Okay. Fancy. Um, made jokes about, about, uh, uh, making five dollars in the stock market um pivotal experience why stanford i mean it's it's like a i don't know um i'm sorry i probably cut off your question too and just started looking for personal statement crap um what exactly was it no i just want to know like how how much you can talk about the math and how much oh um I talked about myself a lot in the in the personal statement. Um, I didn't really talk. I guess there was a 
Yeah, yeah, I talk around myself a lot in the personal statement, but I also, I like, there's no harm in repeating yourself. Like, you can totally repeat yourself. Like, here. Okay. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so there's probably a way to do both. Let's see, was there anything in these little blog things I don't know that's important? Um oh these were just like the columns in my Excel sheet. Um and that was just the yeah, idea yeah, so. yeah uh i was uh way up in well i shouldn't really say way up because the entire state is drivable in like two hours i mean the entire country um, I was in the northernmost um, uh, city. Um, in English, you would pronounce it like Groningen, um, like H's, so it was called Groningen. Um, if you've ever seen, I don't know if any of you have um, um, like Huygens, the Huygens principle, is that like a math? Anyone remember Huygens? Um, it, in Dutch, it's like Huygens. Uh, that's a cool thing. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, it was really in the north of the country, um, and it was absolutely amazing. Um, it was um, amazing to like see uh, a country. So yeah, it's way up here. So the main the main cities are. Um, I'm finally going back. Um, I had um, a long. It's been a long time coming. Um, Rotterdam. The Hague is over here. Um, Amsterdam, Utrecht is like somewhere in here. Utrecht is a really good university city as well. So yeah, my university was really well ranked. Amsterdam is well ranked. Um, there's not really many universities down here in Rotterdam and The Hague. Uh, Delft is one good one. Um, Leiden is another good one. Um, yeah, Utrecht is like right here or something. My computer is not doing well with. Uh, Loading images. Um, where is it there? Oh, it's actually south. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, Amsterdam has probably like three universities, I think. Um, and then there's one, I think there's like an engineering school down here. And then there's one city that I haven't been to yet, which I really want to go to, is down here. It's called Maastricht. Really? No way. Yeah, I'm going back in August 
um, just to see friends and, and uh, just hang out. Um, and I've, I haven't been to Maastricht the whole time I was there. I, yeah, I'm very excited. Apparently it's very different from the rest of the, it's just like, yeah, yes. I, I definitely should have, um, it's a weird thing. Like every country apparently has a Bible belt. Um, and the Netherlands Bible belt is like right here. Um, and so that led to, uh, I was there when COVID hit and the only place that was really hit was like the Bible belt. So it kind of like cut off the southern southern part of the country, um, and like no one was sick the entire time in like the whole northern part. So it was like a weird situation. But yes, I will be going to it immediately. No. Oh really? Uh, just in the Netherlands. Probably probably just in the Netherlands. I may go to like. Um, yeah, that was once uh, the, I, I kept, I got to do good. I got to do good. And then like, um, by the time I realized like I can take time and do stuff was like all the borders were all shut. So I really explored the Netherlands. I, was like, like, I went to like the Frisian islands up here and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it was awesome. Um, I, I won it in like March and then studied Dutch until I left in, in August or July or something like that. Um, I, like I didn't need to. They, there's no language requirement. Everyone speaks fluent English, but I just wanted to try. And then immediately upon getting there, my Dutch went like so down because as soon as I try to speak, they're just like, just talk English. Like <laughs> they're, they're, they speak such good English that it was impossible to learn Dutch. So now, after going back, um, I actually, like two months ago, I lost a 850-day dealing with sleep. It was devastating. I was so sad. I was, like, depressed for days. Um, <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Um, but I'm back. I'm back on it. Um, it's just a, a few, it's like a few-week streak instead of 800 days. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Um, it was different, like um, in a lot of. I, I think it's it's like a, a mixed mixed emotion because I went to a small liberal arts school, like. So I like, um, I, uh, what? Oh, did I say like this one? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, literally this one. Literally this one, yes. Um, and I loved it. I liked, like, some of my favorite courses were, like, bioethics and, like, colonialism. Um, and that's cool. They don't do that in the Netherlands. So, like, super early. I think it's like sixth grade or something. They take like exams that are like, what do you want to do? Um, and it, it doesn't like, you can switch. You can definitely go between different types of things, but they have like different middle school, high school for like different types of paths. Um, and you still have some like liberal arts type things in high school, but like their bachelor's degrees, for instance, are three years because they don't do that. Like there's, no, if you take math, you do math. Like, I'm sure there's like, like an English class is required or something like that, but like um, you don't have to take all the liberal arts stuff that we do. So they're like very um, like when when I was uh, um, when I was doing my project in the fall, I was kind of uh, alone with these PhD students getting you know getting oriented. But in the spring, um, one of their a bachelor student wanted to do a, a, their thesis in that group. And so I was totally at the same level as their like their senior uh, bachelor student, which was like a third year. So like um, I think uh, in the master's, and that's the thing. Like if you don't have a master's degree, you can't get into the teaching. So it's like a it's it's not an issue. Um, so that that was uh, for me that was where like it was like a weird disconnect because I think my advisor thought I was like 
going into a PhD program, I'm like ready for that. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not good. Like I'm a master's student, um, which is, is totally reasonable because like master's program, like I, I definitely felt like a peer with the master's students there. Um, so it was, it was not like great. Um, they're just, uh, it's very it's it's like the master's experience I had. There was coursework the first year, um, a little bit less coursework in the first semester of the third year, and uh, thesis kind of the whole. Yeah. No, it, you can you can do it for basically any. Um, so, um, let's just say you wanted to do the Netherlands because we're talking about it. Um, when you type in a country and the Fulbright, you will get this like country page and you, there are a bunch of different options. You can do these things, which are like with, with these slash university title, like your Delft, this one, I guess there is a university in Rotterdam. Um, I forget where that where that city is. Here's Mythic. Um I applied to this one down here. So this one was basically just a research project. So like technically, I wasn't supposed to be allowed to be taking classes and stuff, but I got there and they were just like, yeah, whatever. They like I didn't I didn't have to pay anything. They were just like, just go into the class. They gave me a student ID, everything. Um, so I applied to this one, which is basically like um, in any field, you can just do like a research project, um, or like it can be part like this, the, the study aspect of it is that like, yes, you can do this, um, as part of a master's degree, um, uh, or you can get into a PhD program and your advisor has some collaborator in Portugal or something. And you say, Hey, I want to apply to a Fulbright and go over there. And you can, it'll be part of your doctoral studies. So that's, that's another common thing that people do. They wait until they get to grad school and then maybe they apply for it then. Um, and you look through these things and find all types of, like if you, if you definitely wanted to do a master's degree, you can do something like this because this is um, an award for like getting a master's degree at the particular place. Um, and so the procedure is, is figuring out um, is there a particular country that's you know good in math, like France, for instance? Um, you would need definitely French um, fluency if you were. So, so, for instance, when I click on this and I scroll down, um, grant type, orientation, students working towards their PhD can do it. Um, anyone can do it. Eligibility, foreign language, none required. Dutch language proficiency not required. Blah 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 but you can certainly, you know, do it if you want. Um, yes, you can do, you can do an independent project, which is what I did. I didn't, you know, want to do a, you know, full master's degree and things like that. Um, or if you were to look at France, that would say something different. It would say like, hey, you need a, um, uh, yeah, like, I, for, I always forget how to pronounce that, but you're definitely going to need a language thing for this. Recommended intermediate. So if I saw that when I was applying, uh, I think I think I'm pretty sure it said intermediate for Switzerland too. Like you can do it was like French, German, Italian. Like you have to be intermediate in one of them, um, and so you have to like prove that uh, through your application. You have to get um, at, at all of your universities, there are people who run this. It's called like the fellowship advising office or something like that. Uh, and they organize it for you. I, I, I worked on the fellowship advising when I was at the Claremont colleges. And it's basically in September, your school will have like an internal deadline, which is like you apply to it and we look at all the applications and we interview you. So there's this like on-campus interview that you do with your university. And you we basically like, uh, found all the faculty who like either got a Fulbright or something similar so that they know kind of a little bit about it. And we just talked to you about uh, your research and stuff. And then it, that gets added to your application. And then I think the deadline is like October 
seventh or something like that. And that's when like everything's fully submitted. Uh, but usually most universities have a, like an internal deadline that's like a month or a few weeks prior. Um, and it just adds to your application. So, so there are uh, uh, several different things you can do. You can do a master's degree. You can just do like an independent study type of project, um, or you can teach uh, English. So that's uh, the ETA type of school like teach English. Yeah. It's yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's it's very prestigious. Um, so um, that's that's why I kept uh, mentioning the statistics because. Um, when you say Fulbright, it's like, uh, let's just do the Wikipedia article will, will tell us, um, um, one of several, um, but yes, you're right. It's it just, it's a lot, it's a very prestigious thing that helps you kind of, if you want to go into academia, um, doing things like that help. Um, and so it is uh, prestigious. Um, it's just that um, depending on what country you pick, the likelihood that you get it is very different. Um, so that's why I kind of um, looked at, you know, when I initially, I was like, my advisor said, uh, Germany, the UK, Sweden, Switzerland, France, Japan, a bunch of places and I was like well some of these require languages and I'm not going to learn them in three months so I can't do that uh, and then I looked at this which is the statistics for how likely it is based on previous years that I get it and then I saw for my particular case the Netherlands was quite high in, in years previous I think it has gone down a little bit um, let's do these open study ones so yeah it's definitely gone down a little bit um, my year, yeah, my year's not on here. Um, so it's like a 10% roughly nowadays. Um, but if you like, I mean, this one will be like probably, well, that's a bit odd. Um, oh, no, no, it's one in three. Uh, that's a teaching, so yeah, of course. So like the acceptance rate for North Macedonia is 33% because there's not many people applying and there's not many, I mean, there's also not many awards. Um, but there's a bunch of different, like there's a bunch of countries where, and then this is, uh, 25%. So like the, the acceptance rate is very different depending on, uh, what country you want to do. Spain is usually pretty hard. Um, the UK is probably very, very hard. Let's go down here. And these are all like all these, you see how many awards there are for in the UK. And there are so many universities in the UK. I don't know why that did that to me. Um, right there. So they have a ton of those like named scholarships. I was I was saying like this uh, this university get a master's degree there, get a master's degree there. Um, down at the the one I usually use for statistics because these are kind of hard sometimes. It's just one in uh, like obviously University College London is like one of the best universities um, in the world, not just uh, the country. So like one in it was like 120 or something like that. Oh, yeah, one in 118. Um, let's see. So this is, I, I think this is like a, in general, like a rough, a rough, uh, and that's, that's why I did that one as well, just because it, it looked, the statistics for the open study research seemed a little bit easier for me um, to wrap my brain around actually being competitive in them. Um, so this one, that's what, like, one or one out of 50. So that's not, I mean, it's not good, but it's it's not as, uh, it's not as crazy as like a fraction of a percent that it used to be. Yeah, so I kind of just went country by country, figured out what countries were good in, in a particular area and, oh, it wasn't a lot, um, but uh, that's the weird thing. Um, my rents for a comparable, like comparable to what I had in grad school and last year, it was 300 euros, which is, I don't know, $500, 400. It was like not a lot at all. Like you, you think of these countries as being like very expensive to live, but when you're there as just like a student, it's actually pretty affordable. 
Um, so uh, I don't remember what my stipend was actually. Um, I think it was like 1200 euros, which is like if my main uh, budget was like uh, housing, food, um, you know, tourism or whatever, I was like saving money. Um, what's that? Mm -hmm. Are. Yeah, of course. So yeah. Running uh, out of time for now. I believe you are not uh, discovered the two hours that was impossible.